Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, for that uh, generous introduction. Um, it is a great honor to me uh, to be here at the Academy. I've followed it closely since before it was opened. I had the pleasure of uh, talking with Fritz Stern and Stephen Kellen and Richard Holbrook about the, the idea that, that Dick Holbrook had to found the Academy. And as a result, I've had a chance to watch its evolution. And I consider it a, a great honor to be here. In fact, to be a lecturer uh, named or giving a lecture named after uh, Richard Holbrook himself. So watching it for 20 years has uh, been quite exciting. I'd like to thank all of the fellows for the warm welcome that you have given me and Nancy since we arrived on Sunday evening. And I'd like to thank uh, Gary, Gary Smith uh, in particular, and his, his good wife, Hannah Schultz. Schultz um, we had a wonderful dinner on Monday evening, uh, just after we arrived. And tomorrow we're going to be hosted by Hannah at her place of activity, which I think will also be very exciting. The the fact that we are here and are so well taken care of is a significant part because of the very careful work of the, of the staff of the Academy. And that, that all started with, uh, with Laura Sager some time back. But when she went on leave, then she, she was ably backed up by Ulrika Grofs. And most recently, really on a minute by minute basis, by um, Lena Ringler, who's been extremely attentive and helpful to us in all that we've done. As Michael said, I'm going to talk about a topic that all of us find a little bit uncomfortable, namely convictions that we have, whether we're religious or secular, whether we're always aware of them or not, and the ways in which those convictions shape our, our public life. Convictions matter at least our own convictions, the central uh, affirmations and commitments and practices that shape our personal and social identities. These all matter very much to us. Yet because we live in an unprecedented series of global interactions, the convictions of people everywhere also matter to all of us, whether or not we're aware of it at any given point in time. We all read about people, probably know at least a few personally, who are passionately convinced that their convictions are absolutely right and all others are unquestionably wrong. We also have friends, neighbors, and colleagues, presumably in considerably larger numbers, who decline to debate such convictions and call for a stance of unqualified tolerance toward all of them. But in an age of globalization, Neither of these positions is viable, even if both may have been serviceable in less provincial times of the past. The standoff between these two positions is illustrated in our everyday experience and etched into our awareness through the media. We see fervent conviction in the headlines, the perpetrators of the horrific tragedy of 9-11 and their imitators since then are extreme examples even among extremists. But there's an ample supply of others. And a sample from across a range of traditions and with enough distance so that we can uh, think about it from a certain, with a certain perspective, think of recent conflicts in Ireland, in Chechnya, in Sri Lanka. Over against this awful carnage, we cannot but sympathize with the call of Western secular liberalism. Religious and other ideological views should be tolerated, but must remain private convictions that do not shape public positions. To state this secular liberal view bluntly, religion and its ideological equivalents must be kept in the closet. 
Individuals may decide to participate in communities based on authorities that are not generally accessible. But such individuals should not expect their private preferences to determine public policies. At a time when we hear so much from right of center political figures, it is worth remembering that this secular liberal view has been dominant in much of the world in recent decades. While fervent conviction can indeed emerge in ideologically fueled mass movements, it is more typically found expression privately or in small supportive communities. As for the US, more public testimony and large scale evangelism have at times been prominent in American history. But even with the growth of the influence of the so-called Christian right, the more characteristic pattern has been one of reticence in imposing particular religious views on the broader public. And the same has certainly been true here in Germany, where the CDU is, would not in, impose private religious views on the larger society, at least almost never would try to do that. In his very different setting three generations ago, William Butler Yeats captured our situation in his poem, The Second Coming. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. For Yeats, as for us, conviction is a telling word. Its Latin root, as of course all of you educated people know, means to overcome, to conquer, to be victorious. Conviction is a state of being persuaded, convinced, convicted in the sense of having any remaining doubts removed. Yet conviction also refers to the act of finding someone guilty of an offense, convicted of a crime. So the word connotes confidence, certainty, corroboration of views that opponents dispute. But the word is deployed to identify perpetrators of what is taken to be evil, as often as it's used to designate advocates of worthy causes. At a time when terrorism has become so salient a threat, it is hard to argue against any attempt to keep passionate conviction under whatever control is available. Yet attractive as the plea for tolerance may be, it cannot appeal only to the virtue of openness to all views and acceptance of multiple perspectives. Instead, any viable response to our current challenges must be prepared to acknowledge, engage, and appraise the, the core values that animate and motivate all parties to the controversies in the current world. This requirement accepts the fact that more than one perspective may be worthy of attention. It therefore rejects any claim to exclusive truth without further debate that allows appeal to generally accessible authorities. At the same time, this approach recognizes the extent to which personal convictions not only express private preferences, but also legitimately influence public policies. To return to Yeats's poetic formulation, neither a lack of all conviction nor an overflow of passionate intensity is adequate. Passionate intensity, intensity alone does not settle the matter, if only because there are multiple candidates who can base their claim on this consideration. And the lack of conviction is not only unfair as a characterization of secular liberal pleas for tolerance, but also in any case is incapable of holding its own against passionate intensity. The imperative that results from this standoff calls for a more robust appraisal in public of views that may at least in the West for too long been relegated to the status of private preferences. We all know that personal convictions have social ramifications. We can no longer afford the luxury of pretending that it is not the case 
even if the alternative is less comfortable than an ethos that simply tolerates any and all positions. In an age of increased global awareness, this need for more robust public appraisal is all the more acute. Appeals to allegedly absolute authority somehow are less dispositive or immediately compelling in the face of completing claims that are similarly grounded. The invocation of the inerrant texts lose some of their punch when the Bible of the fundamentalist Christian confronts the Quran of the Wahhabi Muslim or the Pali Canon of the Theravada Buddhist. The retreat to inaccessible private experience, you just have to know Jesus, to put it in Christian fundamentalist terms, is less overwhelming as a strategy when it encounters very similar approaches in other pietistic and mystical mm. traditions. The processes captured in the buzzword globalization press us toward a comparative perspective that entails public attention to what otherwise might remain private. This comparative perspective that entails uh, uh, comparisons is almost unavoidably critical and at the same time at least potentially self-critical. As we become aware of comparability among ostensibly quite disparate communities, we also cannot help noticing enormous variety within nominally unified traditions. This variety is evident historically. Even the most static traditions change over time. But there are also great differences even at a single point in time, including, of course, the present. We see this variety in our communities both over time and in the present. Mm -hmm. Consider 4th century Catholicism in North Africa, 15th century Christian Orthodoxy in Constantinople, 18th century Deism in England. Or think of the enormously rich and, and diverse streams of Jewish traditions simplified as Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform. Similar and, if anything, even more variety is, is uh, evident in Hindu and Buddhist traditions. In the case of what we homogenize as Hinduism, the diversity is all the more remarkable because it's developed for most of its history within a single, admittedly large and very diverse country, namely India. In contrast, Buddhism moved out from India, across Asia, and more recently to Europe and America, and developed a virtually limitless array of permutations and combinations with other traditions. In particular, in China and Japan, Buddhists have blended their beliefs and practices more or less amicably, amicably living side by side with Confucian, Taoist, and Shinto traditions. Along with Christianity and Buddhism, Islam is the third great missionary religion in human history. And it, too, has become rooted in a remarkable range of cultures. Islam has resisted complete indigenization, in particular through its refusal to, refusal to allow the Quran to be used liturgically, except in its Arabic form. Yet there is still great diversity in Islam, far more than is suggested by the tendency of, of the West and much of the rest of the world to, to identify exclusively with the Arabian Peninsula. After all, Indonesia has the largest Muslim population in the world. India has the largest Muslim minority in the world, uh, is the largest Muslim minority country. And has become, as has become urgently evident in recent years, even within the Arabian Peninsula, there is considerable diversity and tension that the division between Sunni and Shia communities represents. All of this diversity within religious traditions calls attention to a fact too easily overlooked in periods when the prevailing ethos calls for toleration. Religious people themselves have almost never deemed their convictions to be private preferences 
that can be divorced from the deliberations in the public realm. Instead, they have engaged in vigorous debate among themselves as, as to the most adequate understanding of their own shared traditions, because they believed it to be of the utmost importance to be right in their convictions. And they have been prepared to be public advocates for what their convictions imply for society as a whole. At a time of social antagonisms that are in part religiously based, this public face of religion is perhaps unwelcome. Surely the world would be safer if such fervent convictions were kept out of the public square. But this option, so attractive to secular liberalism, is, to repeat, simply not acceptable to those whose deepest convictions want to be, would be relegated to the status of private preferences without any relevance to public policy. As challenging as is the insistence, insistent presence of religion and its ideological equivalence in the public life, it also represents a great opportunity. The recognition of disagreements within nominally unified traditions opens the door to self-criticism. This process is, in fact, always underway. But greater awareness of it can encourage and support encourage support that allows muted or minority or suppressed views to be voiced with greater vigor. An example of this encouragement that is especially attractive uh, at the moment uh, to Westerners and other um, members of developed societies is the call for proponents of moderate Islam to become more vocal over against the, their extremist co-religionists. There occasionally are, uh, there certainly are moderate voices in Islam. Muslims who affirm jihad as, it's, as a struggle to live faithfully who exemplify peaceful coexistence with non-Muslims, who reject suicide bombing and other forms of terrorism. As in other religious communities, there is a contest always underway for the right to claim the designation Muslim. This internal contest should not, however, obscure the extent of common ground across a great range of Muslims in opposition to prevailing trends in the West. Indeed, in this respect, Muslims are also speak for large numbers of religiously serious adherents in other traditions. Here we return again to the contrast between passionate intensity and lack of all conviction. Even those of the religiously committed who oppose exclusionist extremism and hostility to all outsiders are often strongly critical of what they see as the corrosive individualism and secularism of the West. Passive accommodation to the hedonism and materialism of secular Western culture is, in this view, to lack all conviction. The sense of such accommodation, in turn, generates further support for the passionate intensity that the most extreme positions represent across traditions. Just as we encourage debate within the Muslim world, we must therefore also welcome vigorous criticism of prevailing trends in the West. Only if we resist our own tendencies to provincialism and triumphalism will we be able to acknowledge, engage, and evaluate the multiple streams in our own traditions. And on that basis, we can perhaps also recognize points of contact with the very different perspectives of the outsiders whom we criticize. We can more effectively engage opposition if we are willing to address social patterns deplored not only by those who attack us, but also by vast numbers of others, including even many of our friends and allies around the world. Perhaps the most extreme or central instance of those patterns is the celebration of individualism without adequate attention to the communities it presupposes. This tendency is often reinforced with vigorous advocacy for unfettered markets and unimpeded capital flows. 
Indeed, laissez-faire capitalism is frequently presented as integral to the traditions of individual freedom that in turn elicits so much of the convinced antagonism to secular Western culture. The flaws of individualism as it is represented in modern Western free market ideology and mass culture are evident even if cur current patterns are evaluated in terms of their own historical antecedents. And I want to apologize for the level of abstraction that the next few paragraphs are going to um, entail, but I ask you to bear with me. Central to the patrimony that has shaped our current Western patterns are influential figures like John Locke, Adam Smith, Immanuel Kant. Yet none of these thinkers provide support for the kind of uncritical individualism that characterizes the rhetoric of the many of those who invoke their names. As a matter of historical fact, Locke, notably in his lectures on toleration and his two treatises of civil government in 1690, more or less, certainly gave considerable impetus to the traditions that have come to characterize the political and economic orientation of Western liberal democracy. In particular, in the second treatise, he delineates his view of humanity in the state of nature. Over against his predecessor, Thomas Hobbes, with, who had the view that humans originated in a state of hostility and antagonism, Locke envisions equal and independent individuals who enjoy a natural happiness. Yet even though he is far more positive about human nature than his Hobbes, Locke moves quickly to the formation of the state as a protection against the excesses of individualism. Thus, a social contract is required to guard against any who might attempt to live outside the law of nature. Like Locke, Kant is appropriately arrayed with those who have shaped modern Western individualism. His central concern to preserve human freedom and moral autonomy while also acknowledging the powers of scientific understanding places him squarely in this individualistic Western tradition. Indeed, his preoccupation with establishing a solid foundation for personal moral agency and responsibility in the impersonal world of modern science is emblematic for Western individualism, even among those who have scarcely heard of him and certainly are not aware of the revolution in Western thought that, he, that he, uh, his thought constitutes. Yet like Locke, Kant is far from advocating an uncritical individualism. Knowledge for Kant is preeminently exemplified in Newtonian physics. And it can never be a matter of individual idiosyncrasy, but rather must be universal and necessary. Similarly, moral action, reason in its practical employment, to use Kant's uh, language, moral action presupposes a shared context of meaning and common criteria for adjudicating adequacy. In Kant's technical terminology, the postulates of practical reason constitute this shared context of meaning, and the categorical imperative in its various formulations specifies the criterion for determining which actions are moral. This embedding of attention to human freedom and moral autonomy in more inclusive contexts is integral to the analysis of the critique of pure reason, 1781, the critique of practical reason, 1787, but it becomes even more central in Kant's later writings. The tr Critique of Judgment, 1790, Religion Within the Limits of Reason Alone, 1793, and such occasional essays as Perpetual Peace, which he wrote in 1795. Like Locke and Kant, Adam Smith, yes, that Adam Smith, is appropriately uh, enlisted in the cause of Western individualism. His thought also represents the close historical connection between the tradition of individualism and modern Western laissez-faire economic theory. Yet what Smith actually wrote lends little support to the arguments for unconstrained markets and un unrestrained individualism on behalf of which his name is so often invoked. In his An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, 
published in 1776, Smith certainly did argue that individual pursuit of self-interest can contribute to the public good and general welfare. But he also recognized that the ambitious, ambitions of individuals and private groups might be opposed to the public interest, and in such cases would require restrictions imposed by the state. More fundamentally, Smith, whose academic appointment was as a professor of moral philosophy, affirmed the pursuit of individual interests only in the context of a network of social relations, as is clearly articulate, articulated in his theory of moral sentiments in 1759. In affirming the role of the community to constraining the excesses of individual self-assertion, Locke, Kant, and Smith, these three thinkers almost always invoke when individualism of the West is defended. These three thinkers, in effect, stand with the vast preponderance of human wisdom and experience over against only the modern West that so often invokes their names. Perhaps the most radical insight into the inadequacy of the idealization of the individual is the position of Buddhist traditions that there is no self. This teaching, anatta or anatman, is shared across a remarkable range of Buddhist communities. From Theravada traditions in South and Southeast Asia to their Mahayana counterparts in East Asia and to all of their Western offspring in the West. To construe the self as an individual entity is to fail to apprehend the codependence of all reality. It is to be captive to an illusion and therefore to live delusionally. Other religious traditions express this position in various ways. Traditions as disparate as Confucianism on the one hand and Judaism and Islam on the other agree in deeming individuals as constituted through their social relationships. In short, Confucians, Jews, and Muslims all affirm the community, that the community has logical, temporal, and normative priority over the individual. Even those religious conceptions that seem to glorify the individual, in the end, subordinate the self to a more encompassing normative structure or reality. I offer two examples. The Hindu affirmation that Atman is Brahman, that the self is identical with the ultimate, does celebrate the dignity of the human person. But for Hindus, this equation precisely does not exalt the discrete individual as separate from and fi the finally undifferentiated whole of which it is an integral part. Second example is the Greek and then Christian idea of the soul. This conception confers enduring worth on the individual. And unlike the Hindu affirmation of Atman, it does not then dissolve the individual into the whole. Yet even when the soul is construed as an enduring individual entity, which it is not in many Christian traditions, but even when it is because Greece has dominated Christianity, in the end, the end of that individual soul is to love, to enjoy, to worship the divine reality for which it is destined. Unconstrained individualism and feebly regulated markets not only reinforce each other, but in combination also support perverse tendencies that must be resisted. To note two examples, this combination powerfully encourages trends toward the in increased gaps between the top and the bottom of the distribution of income and wealth, and toward the elevation of private interests over public goods. These trends lead to increased burdens on those least able to bear them. But beyond the deprivation of individuals, the single most negative institutional result of this confluence of impacts is the systematic undermining of any positive conception of the role of communities at all levels, from families and neighborhoods to voluntary associations, governments, even multilateral organizations. 
While the process captured in the term globalization certainly can serve to accentuate those perverse trends, greater global integration may also point in another direction. This other direction is already indicated both in the overwhelming preponderance of the testimony of world religions and the um, admiration, admiration of central thinkers in Western liberalism like Kant and Locke and Adam Smith. The goal toward which this alternative points is a sense of increasingly inclusive communities that focuses attention and concentrates investments on the imperative of including the vast numbers of people who so far have been excluded from the benefits of globalization. The goal of an inclusive global community is no doubt a very distant aspiration, very far in the future, a utopian ideal in the, in the sense in which Sir Thomas More used the word, namely, it's no place. Current, indeed, trends in recent decades have resulted in its receding even further into the distance. Consequently, moving toward a goal of more inclusive communities requires not simply further steps in the direction we're already going, but rather a basic change in orientation. In particular, we must shift away from our exclusive preoccupation with markets and individuals. Despite their differences on a host of issues, Locke and Kant and Adam Smith agree on the role of the community or the broader society in, con in constraining individual self-assertion. To repeat, in this respect, they join the virtually unanimous testimony of the world's great religious traditions. The challenge is to integrate this imperative with the dynamism of modern secular economic life, a challenge that can be met only if public goods are valued along with the product, productive capacity of private interests. Rising to this abstractly related challenge in the ways that are concrete will require a host of public policy initiatives. In terms of domestic priorities, the United States in particular must shift fundamentally from proposals that disproportionately favor the very top stratum of society to programs that redress the escalating gap between the rich and the poor. In the American context, that means support for legislation like the Earned Income Tax Credit and a rejection of tax cuts that are indefensibly targeted on the wealthiest citizens. In the international arena, what is called for is a round of trade agreements that in fact deliver on preferences for the poorest countries and increased aid that is targeted on people and communities ready, willing, and able to move forward on the basis of their own efforts as those efforts are stimulated and reinforced through foreign assistance. I will not pretend to lay out a full agenda, you'll be happy to know, of, of legislative proposals on either the domestic or the international front. But the shift from the approach of the recent past could not be sharper. Instead of initiatives that favor the already privileged, we must move toward policies designed to enlist the promise of globalization for the promotion of worldwide communities that benefit not only the rich, but also the poor. An approach to globalization that breaks with the uncritical adulation of private interests over against public goods, of markets over against governments, of individuals over against uh, the, the community, also affords the prospect of reconsidering the character of conviction in the context of inclusiveness. Globalization need not entail acceptance of Western secularism to the exclusion of the traditions of other communities, precisely because some societies have developed ways of appro appreciating diversity and allowing participation in a shared polity, even among those who in other respects disagree on basic issues. The goal of inclusive community does not require cultural or religious homogeneity. This achievement of such multicultural or pluralistic society is certainly fragile. In some cases, particular convictions from those full of passionate intensity flare up with horrible consequences. 
as in the occasional eruption of violence over holy sites in India or the vicious attacks on Muslims in Myanmar. In other cases, relative tranquility is maintained in significant part because large segments of the population are more or less indifferent, might even be claimed to lack all conviction, as is the case in much of Western Europe. The, the, but the fact that remains that large-scale societies have been able to develop social institutions and cultural mores that support an inclusive community. In this sense, an ordered social system has allowed space for the conviction of more than one particular community to be expressed. As the examples of India and much of Western Europe suggest, the context of this pluralism or multiculturalism is often a relatively secular society that offers a stable setting for the expression of multiple uh, perspectives, traditions, religious views. But that need not be the case. Even in the instances of India and Western Europe, the, the setting is certainly not neutral, as is evident from the historical dominance of Hindu and Christian traditions, respectively. China offers another pattern. Confucian, Taoist, and Buddhist traditions have coexisted through a considerable range of orientation of governmental authorities. Yet another example is the interaction of Buddhist, Shinto, and Christian traditions in Japan. This historical variety is significant because it calls attention to the need to resist a provincialism that might take any one alternative to be normative. This orientation might, for example, assume that modern, global, and predominantly Western social and cultural patterns constitute the default setting within which more particular communities may be able to flourish. But this assumption is problematic not only because of the unacknowledged provincialism of it, but also because it overlooks the extent to which the interaction between particular communities and the larger societies can be effective in both directions especially for those individuals and communities that are vehemently opposed to the dominant patterns of the secular West. It is crucial that the prospect of change in prevailing tendencies not be foreclosed. Here, antagonists of the West and opposition from within may share common ground, even if there's no overt collaboration. For the consumer society and mass culture of the West in general, and the United States in particular, have profound have, the culture that we've managed to produce invite vigorous criticism. This mix of consumer society and mass culture is too often little more than a social system minus its ethical and normative grounding. Such passive accommodation to the hedonism and materialism of secular Western culture cries out for a reconnection to the roots of the more particular communities. Such more particular communities may be grounded in a substantial range of traditions, religious, ethical, ethnic, cultural, educational, political, even vocational. In such cases, the, com the communities inform internal norms affirm internal, internal norms that, are, that guide their shared practice. This pattern most readily, is most readily recognizable in religious communities, especially if they re represent a minority within the larger society. But it is also evident in other uh, voluntary associations, whether ethnic, cultural, educational, or political. It may even be uh, realized in professional or vo vocational associations in which Definitive values or commitments, sometimes formally articulate, articulated at other times only tacit, govern the standard of acceptable behavior and frequently energize participants to exert far more energy than would be the case if they just did their occupational duty. What all such particular communities have in common is more or less self-conscious resistance to accepting the conventional patterns of the prevailing culture as adequate to their deepest convictions. Put positively, such communities hold out the promise of a 
richer, fuller social system because it affirmatively incorporates com communities within it. A society so ordered would be worthy as an achievement of globalization and could rightly claim to be an inclusive community or at least moving toward an inclusive community. Thank you very much for your attention. I would welcome your questions and comments. Uh, Lena has a microphone, and if you have a question or comment, uh, please uh, raise your hand and she'll bring in the microphone. You pointed uh, to a quite harmonious perspective uh, to come, but where is the clash of civilizations in your picture? I mean, we have uh, uh, we have individualism, and uh, we have religious beliefs that may somehow conflict with individualism, uh, in so far as religious freedom is not only conceived as as a privilege to exert your own belief within your sphere, but a kind of starting point to make the religion part of the public culture and require a space for exerting your religion as a public power, at least in your own community. We have had these kind of discussions in Canada, for instance, whether the Muslim community should be allowed to uh, to uh, live according to the Sharia. Yeah. So only for the members of this community. But there, of course, is a very deep conflict with the constitutional values of the individualism. And individualism, in this case, is not market radicalism, hedonism, and all this, what you rightly pointed out, too, which is also there. But individualism is human rights. Yeah, and the human rights perspective is now in deep conflict with these kind of challenges. And uh, there, there, there are apparently limits where you cannot uh, adapt or accommodate with these challenges, and there uh, cultures have to fight. Well, that's a, thank you very much. It's a very good question. And um, I am not suggesting in my comments that I think this is all simple or easy. But if we just take the clash of civilizations, and we we'll go on to the human, the human rights issues later on, but it seems to me that the problem with Samuel Huntington's thesis is that it does reify these large civilization civilizational views and says that they're in conflict with each other. And what's absolutely critical is to recognize that within each of those clashing civilizations, there's enormous diversity within them. And if there's enormous diversity in Islam, it is not as if it's homogeneous. There's obviously the enormous diversity, and we're aware of it within Western traditions. But if we once seriously acknowledge, recognize, uh, the plurality with any one of these civilizations. That opens up the possibility of alliances that cut across those traditional lines. And I think that is not at all far-fetched in, in the sense that there are certainly uh, moderate Muslims who have much in common with, I, 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 I say moderate, I mean Muslims who do believe in jihad, but as a personal struggle to be to live morally, and who recognize that they the, the authority of the Quran, but also that they need to be able to interact with people of different persuasions, and to insofar as we talk about Islamic civilization as one artificial whole, they will all identify with with that civilization. And that's what they affirm. Insofar as we recognize there's a plurality within each one of these traditions, it opens up possibilities that cut across lines. Now, the whole set of issues, uh, Sharia, human rights, and, and so on, I think are very uh, critical. And I, th I think it's very clear, and this is one of the points that, that Western traditions have developed, I think, uh, powerfully, that 
even if we have respect for kind of authority, the authority of, of religious positions over their adherents, we are not obliged to recognize that individually, that, that the authorities proclaimed by individual traditions govern all of the other people involved. And so the, the, insofar as in Canada, the Sharia law is, uh, sh shapes Muslim communities, the lines are when it does or doesn't move into the larger public in which the Canadian law will prevail. And I think that, I don't mean that's always a simple line to draw, but it seems to be feasible to draw it. And it's crucial that we not somehow assume that human rights is perfectly clear and value neutral and should govern all societies everywhere. And all these other notions are very, are provincial. Um, I think we need to recognize that our own provincialisms, and I'm not accusing you of being provincial, but I think that the, the, the words that we use are not, are not acceptable to the vast majority of human beings over the centuries and even in the current scene. And therefore, we have to recognize that they need at least to entertain the possibility of other viewpoints as well. Uh, there's a microphone coming. <clears throat> Alex von Kries, I'd like to know um, if, uh, if you think on a globalized world and the conflict we have with different religions, in uh, most of them in very traditional cultures. Uh, what do you think will, will happen, or what do you think happened now? Uh, the effect from those conflict in a, a globalized world, it will be worse because on, on, on the way to research or to, to try to make a new identity, or will be as an, uh, after that an, acceptant, an acceptance from the other and uh, in spite to make freedom. Uh, just uh, I put it once more as a question. Just yes. To make sure that I get. Yes. My question is, do you do you see the the effect of globalization in the conflicts of traditional um, uh, cultures where we have a lot of religions reason for those conflicts as an escalation uh, effect or a effect of freedom and acceptance? Um, well, we all know that there is a tremendous number of conflicts all around the world. And they are um, sometimes between positions that are very different. But as often, they are within nominally unified tradition. So I, if you, here again, it's hard not to at least begin with the, uh, the Muslim world, because it's on all of our minds. But the, the conflicts in you know, Iraq and in Syria, uh, are clearly predominantly between Shia and Sunni groups rather than between Muslim groups and other groups outside. And so the critical need on the part of those of us who are outsiders or the process of globalization is to press for ways that those communities, like the rest of us, can live together without insisting that the other completely accommodate to the pressure of the larger group or the more powerful group. Um, again, that's, I don't mean that's going to be easy or happen quickly, but we can't even begin to get traction on it unless we recognize the extent to which people are shaped by their convictions and need to be able to move to a place where they participate in a larger community where there are people with quite different commitments, even if they're nominally have the, have the same label on them. 
Yeah, Mr. Rupp, uh, Katja Bienert is my name. Um, I want to know you were talking about an increased global awareness. And I don't know um, if this is going to happen, if there is really an increased global awareness. Maybe it's only, we only sped up the possibility to provide the news very quick because of all the new technical stuff, right. uh, the internet, the globalization. But as an in individual, I don't know uh, how my awareness could be increased. Well, <clears throat> I mean, ideally, you would be in a setting like Berlin, where you can interact all the time with people with very different uh, backgrounds and perspectives. But I wouldn't rule out the, the role of technology here. Um, it is simply the case that, that even in the most far-flung communities, there is an awareness of other parts of the world very different from those communities to a degree that is unimaginable, was unimaginable a generation ago. And I would include in that, uh, in the International Rescue Committee, we, we, we're active in 40 countries around the world. And many of them are in the very, the very poorest parts of the world. But they have access to images and reports from all over the world in a way that a generation ago was inconceivable. Now, I don't mean, that doesn't mean that they, they have an intimate knowledge of those, of those other societies or that we have an intimate knowledge of theirs. But we certainly are aware of the dramatic differences that there are. And then the question becomes, how can we think through a larger community that includes those differences within them. And it does seem to me that people, um, even uh, in, in, at very different stages of economic and social development, can participate in that process, and in fact are participating in that process. And you know more about the rest of the world than, than your great-grandmother did. Um, and your grandchildren will know more about the rest of the world than we do now. Thank you for that very interesting lecture. Um, it sounded to me like a very positive utopian view. And so I'm going to ask the question that a great Russian once asked, that is Lenin, what is to be done? The, the, I noted a, a degree of optimism because you're noting the, the sort of variety uh, in these various traditions and the ways in which there are these more positive sides, open sides, etc. On the other hand, if you look at the United States, and the talk impressed me as a very American talk, because we are in deep trouble. That is, this is a country where things are moving in the opposite direction, where you know money is speech, corporations are people, the Supreme Court is moving more and more toward the, the empowerment of markets, corporations, uh, large donors to, to elections, how are we going to move from where we're, we seem to be moving with this greater and greater inequality toward anything like the kind of position which I would share with you that you're advocating? What is to be done? That is a good question. <laughs> um, and you are were gracious to give Lenin credit for it. Um, <laughs> look, I, I plead guilty to a strain of utopianism, to go to your opening comment. Um, and I am very pessimistic about current patterns in the United States, as, as I gather you are. Um, and so I don't think it's going to be quick or easy. But I, because I think we are on a, we, now the United States, I don't mean the whole world, are on a trajectory that leads to multiple dead ends. Um, we will have to. In, work our way out of those dead ends. And our, my hope is that uh, we will do that sooner rather than later, but it may not be as soon as both of us would like it to be. The worry I have is that the United States very often uh, has set patterns that then are emulated by other parts of the world. And so at the very least, we need to work hard 
we, the human community now, to make sure that not too many other societies go down the, the road that we've gone further along than any other one, than any other country has so far. Um, and I think that's really worth focusing attention on. I, um, I guess I'm, I'm convinced enough that the, the patterns that we are involved in in the United States are a dead end, that there's, even if it's only to, to cry out that this is problematical, it seems to me that that's worth doing. And it, it does seem to me also that insofar as the United States continues into the dead ends that we're moving into, we will be less and less a pace setter for the world. And that means we'll begin to learn from what others are doing, hopefully making fewer serious mistakes. But you're, you're right, it's more, opti more optimistic than probably is warranted. Yes. I'm Rolf Schneller, uh, Free University of Berlin. Um, I would wholeheartedly agree with the previous uh, speaker uh, that this is a real challenge. And I do not quite understand, or I can understand from your level of ab abstraction and rational analysis that you arrive at the conclusion that we have to find a way of living together for different uh, communities and live and let live. However, the very uh, origin or the base, the very essential element of religion uh, is that people believe that they have some uh, mes message of truth from a higher uh, extraterrestrial, so to say, or uh, outside uh, the human uh, level. Uh, and how can you convince people like that to give that up uh, with an argument that it's not good for society if they want to enforce their point of view, what is right, onto the other? I don't quite understand how you can expect that from people who are uh, deep believers. Well, um, the, the, the model that you have of revelation of extraterrestrial knowledge that is uh, uh, given to the human community it certainly has exemplars in uh, Jewish, Christian, uh, Muslim traditions, but it certainly isn't evident in all religious traditions, nor is it the only position even within uh, Jewish and Christian traditions. Islam is a tougher case because the Quran is, in fact, uh, the inerrant word of God for, for mo virtually all Muslims. And so I think it's a long way to go before there is a, 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 a relinquishing of the claims for the absolute truth of the, the position of at least several monotheistic uh, religions. What's important is the rec that even those traditions have to come to recognize that they cannot impose their views on the rest of the world. They have to come to the point where they can live with people who don't share those views. And I think the clearest example of the feasibility of that is the extent to which even the most fundamentalist Christians in the United States know that they are not going to be the ones that control everybody's views within the United States. And I think the same will, in fact, happen um, in, in, certainly in, in um, Buddhist, Hindu, Jewish uh, dominated uh, countries, but also in Muslim countries. But it will, it will take considerable more time and tension. And in the, uh, the way it will happen is not because people will be convinced by things that I or some other intellectual says, but because of the realistic fact that they don't have the, the control or the power to impose their views. Um, and so um, it's fair to say I'm excessively optimistic, but I don't think it's, I mean, I, I, the time frame may be very long, but it is not the case that all religious people have a kind of view that you just described. There was... One more question for the Thank you very much, Gudrun Kramer. Um, I think in this particular case, we can actually take um, inspiration from the past, because even the Muslims uh, ruled vast territories that they could not conquer. And 
lived and let live. And right. the Indian subcontinent is the perfect example. So it, is, it was possible in the past. It's possible to extend in the, in the present. And even many Muslims, uh, particularly firm believers, know that, I mean, the Quran tells them that if God had wanted, he could have created everyone one nation. But he chose not to. Uh, because he opted for pluralism. Now, of course, most Muslims would be convinced that they are on the top because Islam is the last and final revelation. But there's a possibility even within the Islamic uh, tradition to opt for more, um, let's say, cautious stand and say, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I do not understand the entire purpose of the, of the message. So looking at the past and looking at the message itself leaves lots of possibilities so that very much uh, strengthen, strengthens your position. Even though I would have said with a strong emphasis on community, I think everyone who's worked on, on gender relations knows that the uh, appeal to community rights and, and order constituted by communities can also be very repressive, so we must go overboard, I think. But you did not suggest any kind of extremism in your talk. Well, that's a, a very helpful comment, and I, I, I appreciate it. I mean, both, both parts of it, but I mean, in particular the first. Even the Ottoman Empire clearly had a, you know, a major ability to incorporate difference within it. It was not as if everyone in the Ottoman Empire had, had this sort of Islam. Um, I know there are questions left, but uh, now that we past the uh, <clears throat> extraterrestrial uh, <laughs> questions. I thought it's time to bring this down, back down to from the level of abstraction and up there to um, questions on a more informal basis in the next room. Thank you very much. I, I actually have a question, but I'm going to save it for breakfast. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming. We're, we're honored to have you and Nancy here and have you as the Holbrook visitor. He would have been very proud as well. And you've touched on a theme that actually uh, many scholars, uh, also in this room, or, or Secor, uh, scholars of you know Egyptian family law and policymakers have touched on. So we're glad that you came and brought this theme. And uh, we'll discuss it for quite a while. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.